Welcome to Meet the Candidates Night, a forum sponsored by the Public Policy Committee of the YWCA PICWA. I'm Nancy McMacken, and I will be this evening's moderator. Tonight's forum is being presented before an audience at the YWCA in PICWA and is being simultaneously broadcast by WPTW Radio. The program is also being videotaped by the Western Ohio TV Consortium for later broadcast on PICWA Channel 5. On your seats, you will find a yellow measurement tool, which we ask you to fill out and turn in at the door before leaving. This information is needed for our United Way funding, and we thank you for your help in completing this. This evening, we will be hearing from candidates only in contested races in the Piqua area, namely from candidates for the U.S. Representative 8th Congressional District, State Board of Education, State Senator 5th District, State Representative 8th, 80th House District, Commission, County Commissioner, and Court of Appeals. We will also be hearing from Bruce Jamison, a representative of the city of Piqua, speaking for the proposed income tax increase for police, fire, and public safety. Rules for the forum are as follows. The issue representative and candidates will each be given one and a half minutes to address the audience. A drawing earlier this evening determined the order in which the candidates and the issue representative will speak. Following these initial presentations, written questions from the audience will be accepted, and candidates and the issue representative will each be given one and a half minutes to respond to the question. The order in which candidates respond will be rotated. The written questions must be of a general nature and must be directed to a particular office or issue as opposed to a particular candidate. Forms for the questions are provided. Committee members will collect your handwritten questions. Please realize that in the interest of time, not all questions may be presented. At the conclusion of the question response period, each candidate and issue representative will be given one minute to offer closing comments. These closing remarks will be offered in reverse order of their initial presentation. In the interest of fairness, time limits will be strictly enforced. Our timekeeper, Kathy Alexander, will hold up a sign when the speaker has 30 seconds remaining. A bell will sound as time expires. In an effort to conduct tonight's forum in a timely manner, I will announce the order in which the candidates will be speaking. We ask each speaker to move to the microphone as the speaker before you draws to a close. Identify yourself at the microphone and begin speaking. Any campaign materials provided by tonight's speakers or others will be available on the table in the hallway. As a reminder, I ask that those of you who have written questions, please hold them up for the public policy committee members to pick up. We also ask that you hold your applause for the candidates and issue representative until the conclusion of tonight's forum. With all this in mind, let's begin. Speaking first will be Bruce Jamison, representing the City of Piqua proposed income tax increase for police, fire, and public safety. City Manager Gary Huff is <laughs> ill this evening. I'm Bruce Jamison, Chief of Police. The Piqua City Commission has placed a levy on the ballot which, if passed, would allow for the addition of five new police officers and the retention of six firefighter paramedics that were hired under a federal grant which is due to expire early in 2015. The levy would increase taxes on earned personal income one quarter of one percent. The increased levy will generate approximately one million dollars annually, which is enough to pay for the six firefighter paramedics currently funded through the SAFER grant and five new police officers. Any remaining funding will go strictly to operation and equipment needs in the two departments. City income tax is not collected on income from Social Security, pensions, unemployment benefits, military pay, public assistance, or alimony received. In addition, interest, dividends, and capital gains are not taxed. The citizens of Piqua are being asked to increase the city income tax purely for the safety of the community and for our families. The additional personnel will make our city safer. The city has been a good steward of the funds entrusted to us through the existing public safety levy. 
The savings in overtime realized in the fire department since implementation of the SAFER grant has already been reallocated to police department and not distributed to any non-safety areas of the city budget. Moving to contested races, we will begin with candidates for U.S. Representative of the 8th Congressional District. There are three people running for this seat, and one representative is here tonight. Tom Petter. Thank you and good evening. My name is Tom Petter, and I'm running for the U.S. House seat in District 8, which is currently held by Speaker Boehner. Of course, Mr. Boehner is not here tonight. I've been a college professor for 20 years, and for the past 18 years, I've served as a faculty member at Miami University in Oxford, the College of Education, Health, and Society, and the Department of Educational Leadership. For 10 of those years, I directed educational partnerships for the university, helping to create meaningful connections in the community and to bring new resources to bear on educational and civic programs. I'm running for Congress in Ohio's eighth because John Boehner shut down the federal government for 16 days in October of 2013. As a Speaker of the House, third in line to the presidency, he shut down the U.S. government in a fit over a settled law. He could have taken a clean vote on the budget on the first day, and he didn't. His actions, his tactics, as he calls them, cost the U.S. taxpayer $24 billion. And every day that he remains in office, he creates gridlock and obstructs progress. For me, from the beginning, this race has been about leadership and presence and a lack thereof. Leadership to me is about vision. It's about ideas. It's about negotiation and deliberation. It's about compromise and consensus building. These are the democratic arts of leadership for the 21st century, and the speaker either doesn't have them or he won't use them. Ultimately, Americans want common sense and teamwork and progress from their leaders, not gridlock. If you elect me to office, you won't be losing a speaker. You'll be gaining a representative. Thank you. Next, we will hear from the two candidates for State Board of Education who are here, A.J. Wagner and Mary Pritchard. Is A.J. here? <laughs> My understanding is A.J. is not here, so we will hear from Mary Pritchard. Thank you. I'm Mary Pritchard, and in one minute and a half, I need to explain to you that I am qualified to go to Columbus to end this thing called Common Core. Um, I have been the Butler County School Board President for the past 11 years. I've been elected five times to that office. And that office, I, I can tell you what I've done. I've changed the Educational Service Center into an organization that does not dictate its serves. And that's what we need in Columbus. My organization that I have been running has been named twice now to the top 10 places to work in Cincinnati. And it's not because we pay the best. It's because we're letting teachers teach. I thought that I would be retiring at this point. But over the years, I've watched local control slip away. And I have watched a lot of money be spent on what we already know. And that is, is that when parents are involved, and teachers are allowed to teach, the job gets done. This thing called Common Core takes local control away. It does not allow parents to have any input into their children's life. It's a federal takeover. And I need your vote, I need your help, because I want to see the locals get back in charge and do what they do best. Thank you. We will next hear from the two candidates for the State of Ohio Senate for the 5th District. Speaking first will be Dee Gillis, followed by Bill Beagle. All right. Good evening, uh, and thank you for having us here today. Uh, my name is Dee Gillis, and I am the Democratic candidate for Ohio Senate here in the 5th District. I am a lifelong resident of the Miami Valley, uh, married to my husband, Kelly, for 46 years. We are the proud parents of two children and three beautiful granddaughters. 
I was a small business owner in downtown Tip City for 25 years. I am now serving my seventh year on Tip City Council. For those years, I served as the mayor. I was pleased to be elected to serve as mayor twice by a council of two Democrats and five Republicans. You see, we can work together, and we did. And this is the kind of working together that I want to take to Columbus. I want to work to restore funding for our schools, work to restore funding for our local communities so we don't have to have all these tax levies. I want to uh, protect our collective bargaining rights and fight to bring good paying jobs to the Miami Valley. If you elect me as your senator, I will not forget the people and place I come from, and I will fight every minute that I am in the Senate for hardworking families in Ohio. Thank you. Now I'm afraid to get up. <laughs> well, my name is Bill Beagle, and I'm the state senator uh, for the 5th District, and it has been my honor to serve you over the last four years. You know, four years ago, I asked for this job so that I could put Ohioans back to work and have Ohio live within its means. And all I can say is what a difference four years makes. Instead of losing 350,000 jobs, we've helped the private sector add a quarter million jobs, including over 2,000 in our region alone in the last year, including places like Fuyo and um, uh, Abbott Labs, Meyer and Tip City, uh, Whirlpool, and Procter and Gamble. Since 2008, excuse me, 2011, Ohio now ranks eighth in the nation in job creation. It used to be that Ohio was living paycheck to paycheck. We had no rainy day fund, and I'm proud to say that after four years, we've built that rainy day fund up to one and a half billion dollars to get us through uh, some tough times. And we've, in, we've reduced income taxes and uh, the cost of doing business in Ohio, putting three billion dollars back in your pockets as taxpayers into our businesses. We've also increased school funding by $700 million in the last budget so that we are spending more in um, primary and secondary education than we have at any time in Ohio's history, despite the fact that our enrollment is declining over the last 11 years. So if you send me back, we're going to continue Ohio's turnaround, put Ohioans back to work, invest in the areas we need to invest in. Thank you. The two State of Ohio representative candidates for the 80th House District will be Jonathan Mikowski and Stephen Huffman. Which one? That orders. Jonathan first. Thank you very much. I'd like to use this opportunity to talk about issues that are important to this organization, which is dedicated to eliminating racism and empowering women. I previously talked about issues that are important to women, like equal pay and uh, domestic violence. And I, begin, I would discuss these issues again because I believe they are extremely important towards our state, not only from my campaign. Uh, domestic violence is a major problem within this state. Uh, right now, our the abuse shelters are almost filled to capacity or overflowing with m mothers and children seeking shelter from abusive relationships. One day last year in 2014, over 1,000 women were admitted into abuse shelters, but unfortunately, 150 were turned away. And one of the things we must do and must guarantee is that we provide these essential services to these people who absolutely need them. And we also need to change the laws about restra restraining orders as well. We need to make sure that ha allow the police the authority to prevent abusers from having the means to either harm or to kill their intimate partners. And we also need to make sure that across the state we have enough shelters with enough room to house everyone who needs you need to be safe from domestic violence. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for everybody for, to coming out. I'm Steve Huffman. I'm a candidate for the 80th Dist Ohio House District. Uh, I'm a lifelong Miami County resident. I grew up in West Milton. I live in Tip City with my wife and five children. Uh, I currently serve you as your um, county coroner uh, for the past two years. 
Um, I've, I've, I decided to run, um, it, people ask me a lot, you know, why, why do you want to, you're a practicing physician, why, you, why do you want to run for the high house? And I say mostly for my children. Uh, I look at the future of Ohio that there's going to be a lot of very important decisions to make uh, for the state of Ohio. And um, it, if I take my children in, in, into consideration, I think Ohio is going to come out better for, uh, for them and, and all of us involved. Um, I, I, I believe my core principles are um, limited government, um, lower taxes, better education system, and defending our Second Amendment right. And I think that um, going to Columbus and representing everybody, everybody in Miami, Miami County is, uh, is my goal. Uh, I'd appreciate your vote on, uh, on uh, November 4th. Thank you. Candidates for Miami County Commissioner will be speaking in this order. John O'Brien, followed by Dave Fisher. Hello, my name is John O'Brien. I'm running for re-election as your Miami County Commissioner on, in November, for, on the November 4th election. Over the past four years, through cooperation among our county elected officials, hard work, and making tough choices, we've made positive changes in county government. We've improved our delivery of services to our citizens through investments in technology and a new county website. We're more responsive to economic development opportunities and more successful receiving grants because of our newly formed Department of Development and we're investing in safety for our citizens and first responders by upgrading the 911 center and improving our road system by doubling our paving program. We're saving thousands in utility usage by installing smart systems in the county buildings. We've done all this and more while making the tough budget decisions. We've balanced our budgets and added our cash reserves every year since the Great Recession. We've passed our state audits with flying covers, uh, colors every year. And we've maintained our excellent credit rankings in the financial markets every year. This has been accomplished because of the leadership we have in county government today. We work together, we cooperate, and we work in a professional, business-like fashion. We've accomplished a lot over the past four years, but there's more to do. I respectfully ask for your vote on November 4 so that we can keep moving the county forward in a positive, professional manner. <clears throat> Good evening, I'm Dave Fisher, candidate for Miami County Commissioner. I'd like to thank everybody for being here this evening in the PICWA YWCA. Uh, YWCA. Uh, this election is about honesty and integrity. It's also about facts. The facts are under, under the leadership we have now, they've raised your uh, sales tax, they've raised about every fee possible, and they've also taxed your license plates another $10. Also during this time, they've also had no bid contracts and went to political friends and a no bid roofing contract that cost the county over a half a million dollars. Now what I can bring to the table is, is honesty. I will work, I will be a full-time county commissioner. I will also get out into the public. I plan on holding town hall meetings at least once a month in various areas of this county. I think we need more public input. We also need to look at holding uh, public hearings in the evenings where the normal working person can get to. Right now, the, the meetings are held at 2 in the afternoon or 10 in the morning. I think we need more public input, and I will, I will definitely work hard for you as your next county commissioner to make sure that this county moves forward in an honest and open way. Thank you. The two candidates for Court of Appeals are Robert Vaughn and Jeffrey Froelich, who will speak in that order. Good evening, I'm Robert Vaughn. I'm running for the Court of Appeals. Uh, about 20 years ago, uh, I made a decision, uh, a career goal to be a judge, uh, and specifically to be a Court of Appeals judge. So I want to share with you a little bit about how I prepared myself for that role uh, over the past 20 years. The first 10 years of my legal career I spent uh, as an attorney in state of Ohio government. I was both an assistant attorney general for several years, and then I spent seven years as a staff attorney at the Supreme Court of Ohio, uh, working on just about every case you can possibly imagine from death penalty appeals to minor traffic offenses to uh, complex asbestos litigation. It was really great experience preparing me for this role that I'm seeking. 
Uh, at that point, though, I wasn't satisfied. I said I really need to go out and get some private sector experience because I think that would be really helpful as well to be an effective judge. So I left the state of Ohio, and for the past six years, I've been an attorney at, this, at Cedarville University. Uh, I represent the campus uh, as an, an assistant counsel role there, and I also teach at the university in the areas of criminal law, criminal procedure, and the American court system. The one advantage I've had in being in the private sector is I've also been able to have a private practice, uh, and that's probably been the best role I've had in having private clients. The vast majority of my private practice has concentrated on representing victims of crime. Uh, I work with a uh, domestic violence shelter in Clark County called Project Woman, and I represent victims of uh, domestic violence who are needing protection orders, uh, needing to navigate the legal system and get the protection they need. And it's been a wonderful experience, and I believe I uh, prepared myself well for this role. I ask for your vote. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Judge Jeffrey Froelich. I am the presiding judge of the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals handles all the cases from all the courts in six counties, including Miami. That's all the cases involving about a million different people in this jurisdiction. These are very important issues. It's a very important job. It requires proven experience and proven judgment. I have been a trial or an appellate judge for 36 years. I was assistant Montgomery County prosecuting attorney. I was a bar association president, full-time law professor at the University of Dayton Law School and a partner in a law firm. I have the experience and the proven judgment to make these important decisions as I have shown over these years. And I hope to have the honor and privilege of continuing to serve as your judge on the Court of Appeals if you reelect Judge Froelich. Thank you. Written questions from the audience will be directed to the candidates and to the rep issue representative at this time. Our first question is for the candidates of the Court of Appeals. Uh, it will be responded to first by Jeffrey Froelich and followed by Robert Vaughn. The question is, how long does it take a case to be, to be decided from filing to the court's decision? Should that time be shortened? And if so, how can that be accomplished? Well, as the presiding and administrative judge, I'm well aware of the figures. It takes approximately nine months from the notice of appeal, but that does not involve the Court of Appeals in taking that, that, that time. That involves getting the record and the filing of the briefs of the attorneys and the oral arguments. From the time it is submitted, that's the oral argument has been made, it takes us approximately 25 days. That's a, that's a process of writing by committee. I may be assigned as the author, then another judge has to comment on that, another judge has to comment on that, and it keeps circulating until we come up with an opinion that is either unanimous, all three of us, or two to one. We may change from author to uh, who writes the dissent. That's really getting too much into the weeds. I can only tell you that we do 12 cases a week. Some of our decisions involve 60-page decisions. These are important issues. They can't be hurried. But we are one of the most efficient courts of appeals in the state of Ohio, and we will continue to be. Thank you. Well, the Court of Appeals is quite efficient. Most courts are uh, in Ohio. We do, uh, and the court system in Ohio does a pretty good job of maintaining uh, uh, resources that the, the taxpayers give to them. Um, at the Supreme Court of Ohio, when I worked there, uh, cases took a little bit longer than at the Court of Appeals. Uh, of course, then you have seven justices all weighing in uh, and multiple opinions. Uh, but the, the key thing is the, is the opinion writing time, of course, um, uh, briefing time for the attorneys. Um, so I, I agree justice delayed is justice denied, and so that, that should be a focus of the, uh, of the court to continue to, to try to bring those numbers down and keep them maintained uh, in an ex expedited fashion. Our next question is directed to the candidates for the State Senate. The questions will be answered first by Bill Beagle, followed by Dee Gillis. The state has over $1 billion in its rainy day fund. Do you see value in having cash reserves in the event of an economic downturn or emergency? The state has a, a billion and a half in, uh, in its uh, reserve fund. And 
the question is, is, is there value in having it? And I think there is. Um, you know, we as families are advised to have what, six months of expenses uh, in cash uh, to cover uh, an eventuality, something uh, catastrophic. And one and a half billion dollars is about three weeks of state spending. Three weeks. So, in, in another reminder that there's value to having a cash reserve is the, the Ebola scare. If there's some sort of major health crisis, you know, we're going to need money to, to cover that. Because we spend our money on Medicaid and health care. We spend our money on schools and education. Those are the two biggest things. And if we need money from somewhere, it's going to have to come from schools and education or from Medicaid and health care. So I, I fully advocate uh, having a healthy uh, rainy day fund. It certainly is nice to have a healthy rainy day fund, but when you have to take that money from uh, your schools and from your local communities in order to have it, there's something wrong with that. Uh, there has been over a $700 million in uh, local uh, tax levies passed since 2011, and so that burden has come back to every every property owner and every taxpayer in in the in this state and so we need to be sure before we just have money laying around waiting for something to happen that we are taking care of what we need to be taking care of and yes uh, we do need to make sure we're prepared for emergencies but we do we'll have money for that thank you Our next question concerns the issue. It will be addressed by Bruce Jamison. The question is, what have the unions done to help save money? Bruce Jamison for the city of Piqua. Uh, through the last uh, uh, years of dealing with uh, recession and uh, decreased funding available to us from outside sources, uh, the unions have agreed to eliminate pay increases uh, they've uh, adapted to operational changes. They've absorbed increases in health insurance costs, and they've assisted in grant writing to obtain funding for operations and equipment, uh, finding cost savings for the departments. Uh, there's been times that their uh, schedules have been adapted uh, into some very uh, unpleasant uh, situations, uh, but they have uh, willingly stepped up and uh, complied in order to meet the needs, the safety needs of our community. The next question is directed to the county commission race. It will be answered first by Dave Fisher, then by John O'Brien. Name two specific things you would do if elected to deal with the heroin epidemic. Dave Fisher, candidate for Miami County Commissioner. Uh, first thing we have to do, we, we need more bed spaces. Uh, the, the sheriff has come up with, uh, with a plan to help open up the jail uh, more. So we definitely need more jail space. Uh, is jail space the, the answer? No, but we also need to look at treatment. Uh, we definitely need to uh, make sure that our law enforcement looks at every option as far as getting these people into treatment. Treatment is, is first and uh, 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 most uh, important as far as this heroin addiction. Uh, when you look at as far as jail space, you know, we have to get the dealers off the streets. Uh, that is, it, it's an epidemic. Unfortunately, you know, we're right on this pipeline of Interstate 75. So, you know, first we have to look at treatment and then we have to really look at enforcement to make sure that we get, to get the dealers off the streets so we have places to put these uh, bad individuals. The county commission has been active in working with the uh, sheriff's office and the courts and Tri-County Board of Mental Health on how to uh, work with the heroin epidemic. We do have an epidemic in Miami County. What, where it has really affected us is in the female population. Typically there were five or six females in the jail 
Now there's between 18 and 25 females who are jailed and they're all related to a heroin issue, whether they're, they have heroin, taking heroin, or doing something to get more heroin. <clears throat> We've worked with the Sheriff's Office. We're currently renting beds in Shelby County, up to 15 beds. Those are for female prisoners because the only jail that can house folks like that is the downtown jail, which mostly has men in it. Uh, the men and the women can't be seen at the, they can't be see each other in the jail, so that creates a problem. Uh, we are working with the Sheriff's Office and our, our Sheriff's Union, the FOP, on solutions that could open a third pod at the 25A complex to put all women in there. But those negotiations are ongoing and there hasn't been a resolution in that and we hope to have that soon. The treatment part of it, we've been talking to Tri-County Board of Mental Health. There are options for treatment, but they are not so long, they're not fix-alls. Uh, when folks are addicted to heroin, it's a very difficult thing to get them off of. The drugs are, they have drugs that are synthetic. It's very expensive. The courts have to agree to let it be used, and the sheriff's office has to agree to let it be used within the court system to try to help these people get off of uh, the heroin. Our next question is directed State Board of Education candidates. It will be answered first by Mary Pritchard and then by A.J. Wagner. Is it true that Ohio has now implemented a program in which students can more easily drop out of school at 16 to transfer to a GED program? If so, do you agree with this program? I have to tell you, I have no idea. I have not heard of that. I'm going to go back. Do I still get my minute and a half? Okay. What's wrong with Common Core? <laughs> um, the State Board is supposed to formulate and prescribe minimum standards to be applied to all elementary and secondary schools in the state. That's what the ORC, the Ohio Revised Code, says. What the State Board did was accept a B-rated set of standards from the Fordham Foundation that were written by people who are not required to, uh, they're not elected, so they're not subject to the Freedom of Information Act. Basically, what we've, what we've got happening here is a violation of the Tenth Amendment. The schools are going to be controlled by the federal government. There's not any accountability. Common Core leaves parents and taxpayers with no real recourse if they want changes or if they have objections. Common Core collects 400 pieces of data on our children from their eye color, to their religious affiliation, to their political affiliation. They want to see how our children feel about guns, whether or not there are guns in our home. And we can put all the stop gaps we want to try to protect that information, but that's not what education is about. Not gathering data for the workforce, not gathering data for commercial purposes. Education is for the preservation of freedom it is for the pursuit of happiness. Thank you. Good evening. My name is A.J. Wagner. My apologies for being late tonight. I uh, unfortunately had a death in the family last night. I was planning on being another, at another event in Centerville, but I had to cancel that, so tonight we could make so It's an aunt in Pittsburgh and had to make some arrangements for the weekend. Um, the, uh, the question about uh, the GED, here's what's going on to my knowledge. Uh, I'm, I, by the way, I am a member of the State Board of Education now. I was appointed by Governor Kasich, and um, although I'm a lifelong Democrat, so I, I work across the aisle. Uh, the, the, the GED situation is this. Too many people have been dropping out and, and then taking advantage of, uh, of being able to drop out and then get a GED to try and complete their high school education. And, and that's been the incentive, is that it's been easy. So uh, what's happened more recently is the, uh, the uh, test is being made harder uh, to, to measure more accurately the abilities that we're asking actual high school graduates to, to uh, meet. Uh, that making the test harder um, has a positive and negative effect. The positive effect is hopefully that people won't drop out so readily. Uh, the negative effect is that we might have fewer high school graduates, which is a problem. So um, uh, we're trying to address it by looking at 
uh, both those issues and both sides of those issues, the immediate resolution which was happened is making the test more difficult. <clears throat> Our next question will actually be addressed to the candidates for both the State Senate and State House of Representatives. We will hear first from candidate D. Gillis, followed by Bill Beagle, followed by Stephen Huffman, and finally Jonathan Mikowski. The question is, Dr. Wynn, co-director of Ohio's Doctors for America, has stated that we must make Medicare expansion permanent in Ohio. Do you agree? Why or why not? Yes, I agree. Um, Medicaid expansion has been passed through the controlling board because the legislature didn't want anything to do with it. It will expire in June of 2015, and at that point, 285,000 people in the state of Ohio will lose their health care coverage. The legislature needs to do something about that. They need to pass. They need to pass it. Thank you. You know, as a former financial analyst, um, I want to see more data before I decide if I think we need to continue the Medicaid expansion. You know, as a chairman of the workforce uh, committee, we, you know, we have a particular interest in making sure we have a healthy workforce. Um, but we've talked about a rainy day fund tonight, and in the end, we're going to end up paying 10% of that expansion, and that's going to be in the billions of dollars. And we've also talked about how uh, most of our money is spent on Medicaid and health care and education. And if all of a sudden we get a bigger bill, um, we need to know how we're going to pay for that. And, you know, on the flip side of that, you know, we were made, um, you know, folks have come and talked about all the benefits of Medicaid expansion. And, you know, if we have a healthier population, if we're able to control costs, which is certainly a possibility, in the legislature we have capped how much Medicaid can grow, you know, there may be a way where we can self-fund an expansion and it won't cost the state so much money, but the data isn't gathered yet. Thanks. The governor has chosen to take Medicaid and, uh, uh, expansion. We need to look how we're going to fund it. My, uh, the, the company that I'm a principal in, we see 1.5 million emergency room patients a year, and, and our now highest payer comes from Medicaid. And um, we need to figure out how to uh, pay for it in the future. Uh, like Senator Beagle said, um, uh, um, we need more analysis on how is it going to affect people, how, who's, going to, who's going to pay for it in the future. And I, and, I, and I agree with what Mr. Mikowski has said before, people need to be taken care of. But there's also their responsibility. And we go back to workforce development. We need to develop jobs and plans uh, that get people off Medicaid, off, off welfare and move into a production part of our society. Um, and that's where we really need to focus is jobs and getting people um, back to work so that we don't even have to uh, depend on Medicaid. Uh, I do support the expansion of Medicaid. Uh, I believe that it's awful to hear stories about people being turned away from health care, not being able to see a doctor just because they couldn't afford it because they didn't have the money. I mean, this is why we had the changes in the health care law, was to stop this from happening. I believe that health care to be a right that people have, and we must do, our can do what we can to make sure that something as basic necessity as just seeing a doctor just because either you had a got the flu or got the, the little 24-hour bug to cancer to a disease that's why we expanded healthcare that's why we expanded Medicaid to make sure that this doesn't happen thank you We now have a question for the candidate for U.S. Representative uh, from the 8th District. 
What would you recommend doing to combat the effects of global warming? Mr. Tom Petter. 90 seconds on global warming. Uh, 30 seconds on uh, Tom Petter. I want to say uh, thank you to the YWCA. I didn't get a chance to do that in my 90 seconds early. Uh, sometimes it's lonely being in uh, a race like this with so little competition. And uh, it's great to see students out tonight. It really is great to see students out tonight, even though their uh, uh, attendance may be compulsory. Some compulsory things are good. As a college professor, I know all about that. Um, I don't get the education questions. Uh, that's my area. It's my discipline. Uh, instead, I get global warming. You know, uh, the president's instituted, uh, with the help of Congress, some really good uh, laws and regulations about the carbon footprint. Uh, we need to make sure that we're paying attention to them long term, that we're following the rules, that we're paying attention to the fact that the planet is warming. And uh, climate change is real. And uh, we have to come to terms with that. And it's going to cost us something. Uh, investing in making sure long term that we're safe and healthy and well and not victims of our own demise I think is really important. And I don't know that the country, I don't know that the Congress, the Senate, U.S. House has that uh, perspective right now. And uh, I'd really like to work on that with representatives and members of the Senate. Our next question is also directed to candidates for the state representative position and for state senate. We will hear first from Mr. Mikowski, followed by Dr. Huffman, then Mr. Beagle, and finally Dee Gillis. What has, this, has the state unfairly shifted the burden of funding schools to the local communities? One of the recent things that Governor Kasich has done and his, and his allies in the Ohio House of Representatives and the Ohio Senate was to roll back the funding that school levies used to receive. Whenever a school raised a levy, they get 50% funding from the state. Now that's been gone away with. Not only does this hurt uh, the funding for schools, it also hurts taxpayers as well. And because in order to make the difference, uh, the, when you raise school levy, the local municipality has to raise their property taxes. I mean. Uh, that's another hit that middle class taxpayers, middle class property owners have to take. So yes, um, Governor Kasich has hurt uh, education through his cuts in funding. Thank you. It was said earlier that um, the state of Ohio is funding education at the highest level they ever have, and we have less students than we have um, in the last number of years. I think the main thing about uh, education is we need to, to um, have a stable funding. Uh, if you look back over the last 10 years, about every two years we changed the formula to fund students, fund schools. And uh, you, you, you ask the school administrators, you know, when they're making their budget, they need to say, you know, I don't know where my funding is going to come in two years, so I can't make plans. And I think the main thing that uh, the General Assembly needs to do is, is have a stable funding formula knowing forward so that our uh, administrators can uh, um, make their plans. Thank you. Well, as Dr. Huffman said, you know, we've, we are spending more than we ever have in Ohio's history. Our student enrollment is down. Um, and we just increased in our last budgets, you know, the largest increase in state funding that we have in uh, over a decade, in $700 million. We have a new school funding formula uh, that is pushing more dollars, uh, more state dollars, into uh, those schools that need it the most uh, in the most impoverished schools. So we shall see if that produces the results uh, that we'd like to see um, from some of our more troubled districts because the data doesn't support that necessarily more money uh, creates better results. Thank you. Yes, there's been more funding put in uh, this budget, but it's still not as much as it was the budget before that one. Uh, it's lower than it was 
four years ago. So we need to make sure that we are funding uh, our, our prize possessions in this state, and that's our children. Now, a lot of the money that has been funded this time is going to charter schools. Charter schools are uh, privately run but publicly funded schools, and a lot of this money has been shifted into uh, taking care of charter schools where they have no accountability, uh, no open records, no audits, and we need to make sure that our public schools are run before we can do that kind of thing. Thank you. To our candidates for the Court of Appeals, we will hear first from Mr. Vaughn and then Mr. Froelich. How would you describe your judicial philosophy? Robert Vaughn, uh, candidate for the Court of Appeals. I definitely have a conservative judicial philosophy, and what I mean by that is uh, judges ought to stay within their prescribed constitutional bounds when making decisions. They ought not to overreach into areas that are properly the, the bounds of the executive branch or the legislative branch. That's, that's one aspect of a conservative philosophy. The second aspect of a conservative judicial philosophy is that judges ought not to make decisions uh, if the issue is not before them in that particular case. We ought to practice judicial restraint. Uh, I hate to use the terms activism and those, those terms get bandied about for political reasons. Um, but, but typically when you hear someone talking about an activist court is when the, the court is making a decision in a case and then they overreach and they make a decision that's, that's not really necessary for the disposition of that case. So they exceed what they really need to be doing in that particular case. They could probably dispose of the case without going further, but they overreach. Uh, I'm an advocate of judicial restraint that we ought not to do that. We should stay within our constitutional bounds and within a conservative judicial restraint uh, philosophy. Thank you. The seven times I have taken the oath of office as a judge, I have sworn to uphold the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the laws of the state of Ohio, and I have done that. If you put my name into Westlaw or Lexis, you'll find about 1,900 decisions just on the time I've been on the Court of Appeals, let, let alone the trial court. That's where my judicial philosophy is. I follow the law. So my support comes from defense lawyers. My support comes from uh, every FOP the, that has endorsed in this race. My support comes from insurance lawyers. My support comes from plaintiff's lawyers and from corporate lawyers, every type of individual that comes before the court. Because they know when they come before me or when I'm reviewing their case, they're going to get a fair and impartial hearing and one that adheres to the law as my oath requires. This question is for Bruce Jamison for, on the City of Piqua proposed tax issue. Who will not be paying this additional income tax? Bruce Jamison from the City of Piqua. The City income tax is not collected on income from Social Security, pensions, unemployment benefits, military pay, public assistance, or alimony received. In addition, interest, dividends, and capital gains are not taxed. We have another question for our candidates for both the State Senate and for the State House of Representatives. It will be answered first by Dee Gillis, then Bill Beagle, then Stephen Huffman, and then Jonathan Mikowski. Commercials are getting very negative, and candidates are being called liars, et cetera. Is this any way to cooperate in Columbus to get things accomplished? No. <laughs> There's no way to act on a campaign. Um, we can talk about votes that have been taken and what they mean and what they mean to, to Ohioans, and we can do that because that's what we've been working for. But when we start attacking someone's character, that's a different story. And so I 
expect to keep away from attacking someone's character, and I don't expect them to attack mine either. Well, I think my opponents had just speak for themselves in terms of whether they're attacking or not. But let's talk about what bipartisanship means, and let's talk about real bipartisanship. Every bill that I've passed in the Ohio Senate over the last four years has had Democratic support. That's bipartisanship. None of them have been passed just on party lines. I have had um, Democratic co-sponsors on a number of my bills. That's bipartisanship. I work with Democratic Mayor Whaley. I work with the Democratic County Commissioners in Montgomery County. I work with uh, Democratic uh, elected officials in other counties. That's bipartisanship. It's a proven record. It's not just someone standing up on a microphone saying, I'll be bipartisan. It's a proven record. Thank you. Steve Huffman, uh, candidate for the High House, the 80th District, and uh, I have had the pleasure that Mr. Murkowski, uh, I don't think, has said a negative word about me, and I have pledged that I will not say a negative word or uh, uh, anything uh, about um, him. Uh, as far as uh, um, other races and things, I, I, I think that um, the one that, that accuses Bill Beagle to be against women and forcing them to do something, I think, uh, was, is, is totally out of character. I, I, his wife, uh, Karen, is up here, and I've known her for many years, and I think to characterize Mr. Beagle to force any woman to do anything was wrong, and, and, I, and I just hope uh, in here in the last two weeks um, that'll stop. Yes, I'm absolutely pleased that our race has been very clean. Um, I went to this race just to talk about the issues and to make people aware of where I stand and what I believe to be true and fight for what I believe in. But to uh, about the tech ad on, um, D on a Bill Beagle on uh, the record against women, um, I don't know like who voted for what. I don't really pay attention to that. But what I know is the end result, and the end result is that Ohio has become the most restrictive states when it comes to uh, women's rights and, and for women's health care. And that is what supporters of uh, myself and D. Gillis are concerned about is that issue. Thank you. Our next question is directed to the candidates for the Court of Appeals. We will hear first from Jeffrey Froelich, followed by Robert Vaughn. Should all judicial positions at the state level be appointed or elected? Please explain. If elected, should there be restrictions on financing of campaigns or campaign advertising? This is an issue that's currently before the United States Supreme Court as to what sort of restrictions can be on judicial campaigning. The issue of whether or not to elect or appoint our judges has been before the public of the state of Ohio on two different occasions. One in the late 70s that said that all judges should be appointed rather than elected. That was defeated by about 80 to 20. Then about 10 years ago there was a proposal that the Supreme Court and Court of Appeals be appointed rather than elected, and that was defeated about 60-40. So what is important in electing judges in Ohio is that we have an informed electorate. It's at the bottom of the ballot. A lot of people don't pay it a lot of attention. There's a lot of drop off before you actually get to the judgeship. But the judgeship affects your life as much as, if not more than, many of the other offices that receive a lot more public attention. So what's important is that you become informed, and then you make an intelligent informed decision. And that's why forums such as this sponsored by the Y are so beneficial to the public as well as to the candidates. Thank you. I'm in favor of judicial elections. Uh, as was stated, Ohioans are in favor of them overwhelmingly, always have been, I think mainly because uh, folks have a desire and I believe a right to, to have a say in who rules over them. Uh, who holds positions of power, and so I, th I agree with that principle. Um, 
as they are going to be stay elected, as the voters have so clearly said, uh, the second part of the question, I believe, was should restrictions be placed on campaign financing? Um, I'm not in favor of government restrictions. I think we would have some constitutional issues with that. Uh, so an imposed restriction uh, is not necessarily good. Uh, however, I do think candidates ought to self-impose some restrictions. In this race, I have personally said I'm not going to take money from lobbyists. I have not uh, sought or taken money from any political action committees. I have not sought, uh, not gone to bar associations and attorneys that regularly practice before the Court of Appeals and asked them for money. I don't want to further some public perception that if I'm elected that my decisions would be based on who's funding my campaign. That is a public perception that's out there. Um, unfortunately, it may not be true because there's conflicting studies on that, but it's a public perception. And so I'm taking a principled stand on that position. And if I think, I think if other judicial candidates would do that as well, that public perception would wane and people would have more trust and confidence in their courts and the integrity of the court system in general, which it would help the rule of law. Thank you. For the candidates for State Senate District 5, we will hear first from Bill Beagle, then Dee Gillis. What is your position on the stand your ground issue? Uh, the stand your ground issue, uh, there is a bill that's been passed uh, that uh, has not been heard by any of, of my committees. Mm -hmm. It's something that I would have to uh, look at more. I am a strong Second Amendment advocate uh, and believe in a person's right to, uh, to bear arms and defend themselves. Uh, but I do want to understand uh, what Ohio's stand your ground is because people tend to boil things down and they'll say stand your ground. And is that the same as Florida stand your ground? I don't know. We'll need to ask questions about that. So um, let's continue to ask questions and get a better understanding of, of how the law is. Uh, we'll talk to law enforcement. We'll talk to victims groups. Um, we'll talk to uh, pro stand your ground advocates and, then, uh, and hear what they have to say about it. Thank you. I am also a supporter of the Second Amendment um, and a supporter of all the amendments. Um, I am not in favor of a stand your ground law. Of course, we all need to look at these laws and see what's in them before we uh, would vote on them. Uh, I do not believe in uh, that, that, I believe that would give people more chance to just shoot and think later. And so we need to, uh, we do need to look at everything. And if I could just say one thing about uh, the ad about the women, that is not my ad. I seen that ad on TV just like everyone else. I had nothing to do with that. For Tom Petter, U.S. Representative, um, House of Representatives, do you think the federal government is doing enough to protect people from Ebola? <laughs> So much. <laughs> Global warming and Ebola. <laughs> Same night. Thank you. Well, when does my 90 seconds start? Um, look, uh, I'm no uh, expert on communi communicative diseases. We have a person up here who has a medical degree. He might want to talk about that in his 90 seconds. But I think citizens expect that the federal agencies and that the government, representatives and others, the executive branch, will pay close attention to things that have a potential impact on us, right? I think, I think we all agree that's an important function of government. One of the things I'm concerned about as I think, perhaps, I hope, the scare winds down and we have more and more people who are cleared and less people who are in danger, and less people uh, who actually have the disease in the United States is that we take a look at one of the things that is part of our responsibility, that is to build an infrastructure not built on cuts. Sequestration has hurt us. It's hurt the CDC and it's hurt the NIH. We have to have research and we have to have the ability to respond. And we don't, when we don't have a budget to respond, guess what? We make errors. 
So let's make sure that we fund the things that are really important in our infrastructure, like community health. We have another question for the candidates for state senator. We will hear first from Dee Gillis and then Bill Beagle. With the ever-changing world of education, I would like to know your stance on school choice and what your thoughts are on the fact that local charter schools have taken over $700,000 away from the Piqua City schools. Bottom line, what is your stance on school choice? I think I pretty much answered this question once, but um, uh, there, is a, there is a place for charter schools, but we first must make sure that our public schools are properly funded. Uh, and if we are publicly funding charter schools, then we need oversight. We need to make sure that there's accountability, that there's open records, that there's an audit. These things uh, we need to do with all of the money that we spend, wherever we spend it. Thank you. I'm a supporter of, of charter schools, and with all taxpayer dollars, we do want transparency, we do want accountability, and Senator Lehner is convening a, a committee, a task force, to take an overall look at how charter schools are uh, regulated. Uh, there are a fair number of things going on that I think we need to, to clamp down on. Um, but remember, we also have public schools uh, that are uh, scrubbing data to improve their test results and things like that. So accountability for tax dollars and accountability for results covers all education, not just one side or the other. Thanks. This question to the candidates for uh, commissioner. First, be answered by John O'Brien, then Dave Fisher. What do you plan to accomplish in, next, in the next years? Name your top three priorities. Uh, John O'Brien, we need to continue to watch the county finances closely. Uh, we work cooperatively with all of our elected officials and talk to them on a regular basis about what their needs are and then we talk all the time about how we can fund those needs. We need to continue to improve the delivery of services to our customers. Miami County was woefully behind in, in their technology infrastructure. We've invested a lot of dollars in improving technology in the county so we can deliver services that folks in this crowd are used to getting from their private sector. We're, we've done a lot, we've got a lot more to do in that area and we need to make sure that our citizens and our first responders are safe by continuing to improve and upgrade our 911 system. There's uh, mandates coming down from the state of other things we need to do with 911, so we need to make sure we, we do that correctly and do it uh, uh, efficiently and cost effectively. Dave Fisher, candidate for County Commissioner. Uh, first, I wanna look at the uh, quarter percent sales tax. I wanna really dig into it and see exactly where these dollars are, are going. Uh, I would like to propose that we repeal that. Uh, I think that uh, it was first set, uh, set up for 911, but only a portion of that actually went to 911. And not only that, they also, uh, they also tacked on a four and a half million dollars on, uh, on, on bonds that were paying a debt service until 2025. So, you know, my opponent keeps saying that we've got, you know, a lot of reserves. Well, where's the reserves coming from? They're coming from the backs of us as citizens. The other thing I also want to look at is all the fees that have been increased in this county. Uh, I, want to, I want to get in there and actually look and see if, if they're even comparable to counties our size. I mean, we're, we really need to look at it because we as citizens have been taxed. I don't care how you, how you look at it, whether it's a fee or whether it's a tax. It's a tax. We're, we're spending more, we're, we're, they're taking more money out of our budget. The last thing I want to do, I want to make, I want to make this government open. Uh, like I said earlier in my opening, I want to make sure that we, ha we can hold public meetings in the evenings. I also want to make sure that to, if anything comes before the Board of a Commission, that we hold these uh, meetings in the evening. Uh, we, we've got to get more public input, and I plan on getting also out in the county, like I said, and doing some town hall meetings at least once a month somewhere in the county. That way I can get input from all of you.
This question is for the candidates for the state Senate position as well as the U.S. House of Representatives. It will be answered first by Bill Beagle, then Dee Gillis, then Tom Petter. Will you follow the dictates of your party or will you be independent enough to do what is right for the people of your district? Well, you guys have heard my bipartisan talk uh, and the demonstrated proof that I have that I reach across the aisles and do uh, bipartisan things. Uh, in terms of uh, party loyalty, uh, there's a number of examples where I've deviated from my party on my vote, uh, specifically on uh, Senate Bill 310, which was uh, established some or froze some uh, renewable energy standards. I uh, broke from my party to vote no on that. I broke from my party to vote no on a pit bull bill, uh, which was actually not too far away from a pit bull attack right here in Piqua a couple of years ago. Um, and um, I also voted for uh, redistricting reform, uh, which was not particularly popular with some members of our party. I sit on Tip City Council with five Republicans and two Democrats. I've had to work uh, across the aisles on many, many things. Uh, one thing that I did work across the aisle on was a compromise uh, when we raised council's pay starting in 2016 and did away with the health insurance for council members, which actually saved the city money. That, that was a compromise that we did as a council and was passed. So I can do that. Tom Petter, candidate for the U.S. House, uh, dictates of the party. I married a Republican 27 years ago, <laughs> and that's gone pretty well. <laughs> Two kids uh, reaching across the aisle, got to practice that. I've told my campaign staff when I go to Washington, I'm going to create a purple caucus. I want people to start talking about the things that matter most to Americans and getting the work done on the ground. You know we have the highway trust fund that's in jeopardy right now. Do you think the House and the Senate are going to work on that together productively during 2015? I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen in 2018 either. I'd like to be in the House and making people move. Um, I've been a Democrat from the beginning. Uh, if I were 18 in 1980, I would have voted for Carter. I thought he would have had a much better second term. And Mondale killed Reagan in the three debates in 84. Did anybody see it? <laughs> it was a disaster for Reagan. He won anyway. I've been a Democrat for a long time. Uh, I voted for Obama. I know somebody who won't admit that. Um, I feel like uh, we can really make some progress together if you elect someone to the House that will uh, represent you, that will pay attention to you, that will have a presence on the ground. And this is something I promised everybody that I've seen in District 8. I will have a public meeting that everyone is welcome to attend twice a year in each county. That has not happened in 24 years or longer or maybe back to 1939 when the last Democrat sat in the U.S. House seat for District 8. Okay, we have another question regarding the proposed income tax increase for the city of Piqua. If crime is such a serious issue in Piqua, should you actually be asking for more than a quarter percent increase? Bruce Jamison, City of Piqua. Yeah, if you're offering more, I'll take it. Uh, our, uh, our studies uh, that we're well trained to conduct and even uh, that we've accepted from other uh, bodies routinely indicate that with our crime rate, our population, the various things that we are dealing with, that we should have 15 to 19 more police officers. Uh, that's just too much to ask of this community. But this community deserves uh, more protection than what they're currently receiving. Uh, we can do that uh, with additional officers. We could make five officers count, and uh, they would make a difference and would make this city safer. The final question we have time for this evening is directed to the candidates for the State House of Representatives. It will be answered first by Stephen Huffman and then Jonathan Mikowski. What is your position on the legalization of marijuana? Please explain. Uh, 
I get to ask this a lot as a practicing physician. Uh, if I see no need for medical marijuana, there has been no study ever presented to the FDA that it's better than any other drug out there. There's a lot of anecdotal uh, research out there that says, oh, it made me feel better and it helped my glaucoma and it helped my chronic pain. We have a lot of great drugs out there that's cleared by the FDA that is a lot safer, uh, that has a lot more research done on it. Um, so if they do medical research and shows that it is, then, then, then we should have it. But uh, no one has ever done that. There's also about 10 times more carcinogens in marijuana than there is cigarettes. So you need to take that into, into uh, account. As far as uh, um, um, uh, recreational marijuana, I think, uh, you know, it needs to be studied, what we're going to do, how we're going to control it, uh, and ha how to, we're going to prevent people from being impaired with it on the street. I have spoken Excuse me. I have spoken previously about uh, marijuana. I oppose the absolute legalization of marijuana, but I am open to looking into the idea of partial legalization of medical marijuana only. Uh, I believe this is something we should look into. And basically, basically, we do have a federal system of government, and I am interested to see how this works out in states like California and Colorado. Whenever they secede or fail, or fail should be a test experiment for the rest of the nation. Thank you. In closing comments this evening, the speakers will be addressing you in the order reversed from their opening comments. Each has one minute to give their closing comments. We will start in the reverse order from the opening statements, beginning with the candidates, followed by the representative for the city of Piqua proposed income tax increase for police, fire, and public safety. Closing statements will be given by Jeffrey Froelich, followed by Robert Vaughn for the Court of Appeals. I'm Judge Jeffrey Froelich. The Court of Appeals reviews, as I said, the decisions of all the cases from all the courts in six can to see how this works out in states like California and Colorado. Whenever they secede or fail, or fail should be a test experiment for the rest of the nation. Thank you. In closing comments this evening, the speakers will be addressing you in the order reversed from their opening comments. Each has one minute to give their closing comments. We will start in the reverse order from the opening statements, beginning with the candidates, followed by the representative for the city of Piqua proposed income tax increase for police, fire, and public safety. Closing statements will be given by Jeffrey Froelich, followed by Robert Vaughn for the Court of Appeals. I'm Judge Jeffrey Froelich. The Court of Appeals reviews, as I said, the decisions of all the cases from all the courts in six counties, which had in turn made the decisions involving approximately a million people. All types of cases, I have been there as a lawyer, as a trial judge, and as an appellate judge. It's an important position. It requires experience. It requires proven judgment. It requires a reputation of fairness and impartiality among the lawyers, among social service providers, among law enforcement. I believe I have that. I hope you ask people that are in those fields who they support, and I hope you return me to the Court of Appeals for the honor and privilege of continuing to serve you in that position. Thank you. You know, one advantage I had of going into the private sector was um, representing private clients. Um, as a state of Ohio attorney, you represent the state. Uh, as, a, as a court of appeals or a Supreme Court of staff attorney, you don't have a private client. Well, as a private attorney, you have clients, and they're real people with real problems. Um, people come to hire an attorney because something is broken in their lives, and you get a chance to help them at that point. So I understand that when people are, their lives are being impacted to the point where they're in front of a court, it's a bad time for them. 
I have, I have sat across the table, as, as I said, I pr practice primarily with crime victims. I've sat across the table from far too many mothers who've lost sons to homicide. I've held their hand, I've cried with them, I've prayed with them. It's real, and I understand that. And so that experience is recent, it's real, and I want to bring that to the Court of Appeals. And I ask for your vote. Thank you. <coughs> Miami County Commissioner candidates will begin with Dave Fisher, followed by John O'Brien. Dave Fisher, candidate for Miami County Commissioner. First off, I want to start out with uh, Boy Scout law. First thing is, a scout is trustworthy. In recent time, in over the last year or so, we've had some issues within the maintenance department in the county. Special prosecutor had two uh, decisions. First one, he said that there is a culture of corruption in Miami County. The second one, he came out and said, my opponent lied to the sheriff and he lied to the prosecutor. Ladies and gentlemen, do we need that kind of leadership in our county? I say no. It's time for a change. It's time for someone that's going to go in and do the hard work that needs to be done as your county commissioner. And I will never lie to you. And I ask for your vote on November 4th. Thank you. My name is John O'Brien. I'm your county commissioner and I'm running for re-election because there's a lot more to do in Miami County. We've accomplished a lot in the last four years, and I want to do the job for you like I've done every day since being elected. When you're elected to office, of, in any office in Ohio, you take that oath in office to uphold the laws and constitution of the state of Ohio and the United States. I would never, nor will I ever, do anything to, to go against that oath of office. <coughs> you can stand by me because you know what you get from me. I, I believe in positive progress in county government. I believe working cooperatively with our other elected officials in the county and our local municipalities, villages, and townships, and I have a record of doing that. I've been on the ballot several times, and so has my opponent. You know who to believe and who not to believe and what to believe and what not to believe. I respectfully ask for your vote on November 4th in the primary, and God bless. The State of Ohio representative for the 80th House District will have Stephen Huffman speaking first, followed by Jonathan Mikowski. I'm Steve Huffman, a candidate for the 80th District, and I, I respectfully ask for your vote. Um, I, I think, uh, like I said earlier, uh, two things very important to me is my faith and my family. Uh, and if you hold those up, uh, um, I, I believe most of Miami County uh, ha have the same values that I do. Um, I think uh, my desire to serve in the House of Representatives, um, uh, like I said, dates back to my family. I've spent a year and a half overseas serving in the missions, serving others. And I think that this is a continuation of that, to continue to serve. A, um, I, I currently serve as Azure County Coroner, and I'd like to continue to serve the people of Miami County and Southern Dark County as their next state representative. I appreciate everybody's time tonight and uh, uh, would appreciate your vote on November 4th uh, for Steve Huffman for the High House. Thank you. I went into this campaign to fight for what I believe in and to follow my own convictions because I believe in strongly in the power of my convictions. So I primarily focused on the issues in my campaign and I'll continue to do so until the end. Like this organizer said, organization is dedicated to empowering women. I am also dedicated to that as well. Uh, you empower women through education, getting more women into the sciences, into mathematics, into medicine into engineering, as well as the arts and humanities. We also empower women through toughening our laws against domestic violence. You also do that through toughening the laws concerning restraining orders. Right now, 94% of women who are murdered were killed by their intimate partner. One in three teen girls either were physically or mentally abused by their boyfriends. Women are three times as more likely to be stopped. That's what I'm dedicated to, empowering women and strengthening 
our laws against domestic violence. Thank you. Candidates for the State of Ohio Senator from the 5th District will begin with Bill Beagle, followed by Dee Gillis. Well, I'm Bill Beagle, and it has been my honor to serve you as your, uh, as your State Senator over the last four years. You know, as a, uh, as a husband and a father of three, I know that there are, had to be a lot better places for you guys to be tonight. It means a lot to me that you would come out and take the time to educate yourselves and offer very thoughtful questions. Um, and to be part of this dialogue tonight. You know, Ohio is turning around. We've gone from an environment where we're losing jobs to one where we're helping the private sector create jobs. We've gone one of financial instability to one where our credit rating is getting improved and our rainy day fund is restored. And we're going to one where we're investing in education, we're reducing taxes, and I'm asking for your vote on November 4th so we can continue the hard work and tough decision making that we've been doing over the last four years and continue to deliver on Ohio's turnaround. Thank you. I would like to address the so-called $8 billion deficit. Uh, Ohio a Constitution mandates that each budget is balanced. And the truth of the matter is that Governor Strickland's budget was balanced and it was $250 million in the black at the end of his year, at his four year, at his session. So, the fact that at some point they looked into the budget and seen that it was $8 billion in, in debt, then what happens is they looked at it then, but it wasn't in the end. And so all things are like that. When you, when you balance your budget at home, sometimes you have a little more out at this time than you do at this time. And so our Constitution mandates that these budgets are balanced, and they are. Now, I would like to be your senator, go and look at the budget, see what I can do with it. Thank you. Candidates running for the State Board of Education will begin with Mary Pritchard, followed by A.J. Wagner. YWC, thank you so much for having me, and I really do appreciate you students coming out tonight. Uh, I'm an empowered woman. I have a degree in mechanical engineering from The Ohio State University, but my favorite degree is my Master's of Science, and that's the one that my superintendent puts on my business card every time he orders me business cards, my Master's of Science in Domestic Engineering. That means I'm a mama. I want your vote because I think that most parents would work four or five jobs for their children if they thought that was what was best for what was best for them. But I feel that, unfortunately, we've gotten the wrong idea that somehow somebody at the state level is going to tell us what's best for our children. Some professional out there is going to do the job that only an amateur can do. That's us, the parents that love their children, and we do it for them. We need to get back in touch with our teachers, and we need to recognize that local control is where it's at. Thank you. Uh, good evening again, and thank you again to the YWCA for uh, hosting this tonight, and thank you all for being here. Um, if a child is three years old and they're brought up in poverty, they're going to have a vocabulary of about 500 words. A child who's middle class or above is going to have a vocabulary of about 1,500 plus words. There's already a huge deficit that, that they will probably never overcome. You can do all the testing in the world. You can do charter schools till the cows come home. You can do common core. But the truth is, we're not going to get to the core of our failing schools unless we get to poverty. Look at the failing schools. Look where they are. They're in our poor neighborhoods. The issue isn't just education. It's poverty. And how do we help those children who are in poverty overcome the emotional and the intellectual deficits that they have because of the atmosphere that they're brought up in? That's the challenge, I think, for our school board. That's the challenge that I want to take on. Mm -hmm. 
The candidate for the U.S. Representative 8th Congressional District, Tom Petter, will now make his closing remarks. Thank you, Tom Petter, candidate for the U.S. House. I, I got in this race last fall uh, while the country uh, ground to a halt. And uh, as a Democrat, I knew no one ran against Boehner in 12. And uh, I thought a lot about it, and I felt like it was time for me to step up and run. Every race has to be contested in this country. Every race in Ohio, it's important for all the parties. It's important for all the citizens. You know, I know what this is. This is about stewardship. It's about democracy. And uh, I also know that I would love to have the Speaker of the House run ads trashing me the next two weeks. Wouldn't that be something? Because that would mean what? I'm close, right? <laughs> I'm close. The Speaker polled at 46% last week. This is closer than anybody on the ground thinks it is, except for the people that we're contacting who could turn the tide. It's not over till it's over. Thank you. Bruce Jamison, representing the City of Piqua, proposed income tax increase for police, fire, and public safety, will offer comments on the tax increase in his closing. Bruce Jamison from the City of Piqua. While Ohio electioneering and ethics law prohibit me from directly asking you to vote for the Piqua income tax levy, it's my hope that you will exercise your right to cast a vote on November 4th <laughs> and that you will base your vote on accurate information. <laughs> if anyone has questions about the operations of the departments or city budgeting practices, I ask that you follow up with que questions by coming directly to the source. Uh, Chief Rindler from the Fire Department is glad to answer any of your questions about his department. Uh, City Manager Gary Huff is willing to speak to issues related to collection and dispersal of the tax dollars. And I'm very anxious to speak to anyone about how and why we do what we do at the police department. There are many good things occurring in Piqua, and the police and fire departments want to be a part of the positive changes by providing a safe environment in which economic growth can occur. The citizens of Piqua deserve the benefits of a vital and a safe community. Thank you. We would like to end our forum this evening with a few comments. You may still vote in person at the Miami County Board of Elections located on the ground floor of the courthouse at 215 West Main Street in Troy on the following days. Thursday, October 23rd and Friday, October 24th from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday, October 27th through Friday, October 31st from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Saturday, November 1st from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Sunday, November 2nd from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. And Monday, November 3rd from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. The polls are open on election day, November 4th from 6.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. Remember to take a photo ID to your polling place when you vote and announce your name to the poll worker. The YWCA PICWA does not endorse any issue or candidate. We also ask you to complete the yellow measurement tool in your chair and turn it into a committee member before leaving. We'd like to offer our thanks to WPTW Radio for taping tonight's event for live broadcast on 1570 AM, to the Western Ohio TV Consortium for taping tonight's event for later rebroadcast on PICWA Channel 5 to WHIO-TV Channel 7 and Steve Baker, to Piqua Daily Call and area newspapers for promoting this evening's event. Thank you to our audience present and those listening at home. And especially our thanks to the candidates and to the issue representative for caring enough to participate in the Meet the Candidates event. Please join me in offering a round of applause for all of them. And to all of you, remember to vote. It's your responsibility. <laughs>